Okay, so I think it glitched out because I was on day 28 and then it's now day 29. Um, so I'm going to assume that the game glitched out again. It was doing that thing where nothing would open again. With the remainder of the day, I... I helped the kitchen staff to clean, earning 60 pounds, as well as learning from her that merchants in Yokohama will pay fantastic amounts of sheets. It was intriguing. We boarded a Chinese steam train at station. It was a smooth journey till we reached where there was a change of ga gauge from the Russian to the Chinese rail. To relieve the tedium of waiting, I attempted to better understand the mechanisms the engineers were using. They seemed to consist of hydraulic pumps intended to jump the train from one rail to the next, and I could not help but notice they were not stamped with an artificial seal. The character is suave. We restarted our journey a few hours later, only for it to be yet again interrupted by Chinese customs officials at... They were as brusque as the Russian officials. Clearly, the bonds of bureaucracy overrode those of the nation. They stamped our papers with their square ivory seals, leaving a distinctive red cinnabar mark. French are the worst for short memories. <laughs> Today we reached fame for the Imperial Palace. Alas, there was no time for exploration, for here our train divided, half going west to and the other half turning east to Beijing. Yeah, some of these things are hard to say. spent this day attending Monsieur Fogg, who had managed to find a week-old English periodical which proposed a new fashion of tying one's cravat. I ventured that the traditional method was tried and true. This smacked to me a frippery. Monsieur Fogg gave my clothing a doubtful look, incroyable as I was most stylishly attired. Perhaps, he announced. I practiced the new uh, technique before bed. A gentleman's gentleman can never be too prepared. Your character is now well healed? Uh, I don't know what that means. We 
We reached in the dark. I could see little of the platform, much less of the city. The soldiers guarding the station seemed nervous and unfed. Monsieur Fogg seemed to not, not notice the tension in the air. But I had a presentment of unpleasantness that would not leave me. My friends, I am not a superstitious man, but I felt a chill that night. We shared a carriage to our hotel with a group of talkative Protestant missionaries who blessed us at, a, at great and exhaustive length before we managed to escape to our beds. We, As I drifted off to sleep, I wondered what it would look like in the morning light. I kind of like the train sound. Where are we? Wait. Poyam. Why did it get quiet? Oh. It was just my device being weird. Okay. Suppose we can just depart then. We found a small fishing yacht whose crew were earning a little extra money by taking passengers around the coast. We were put aboard with a few other travelers and each given a tiny area in which to bunk down. The fishermen were cheerful souls despite their rough conditions and hardy life. They sang shanties as they fished and tossed equipment at each other with abandon, hoping to send their fellows tumbling into the sea. I joined in their sport, missing my old acrobatic days, found myself rusty but still nimble. Monsieur Fogg, let us say, did not much approve. I don't think I'm going to get this guy to like me. If you're going around the world, you might as well enjoy yourself. I spent the day waiting on my master's needs, talking to other passengers, and attending to his parting, tell me 
he smirked as I worked. Did, did you ever train to be a valet? Such a thing to be asked. Redoubled my efforts, but to little avail. The sun set behind the distant land, and the waves lapped around our boat. The fishermen sang as the stars appeared, and for the brief moment, all was calm. Our boat arrived in the early hours of the next morning, and our fishermen waved us ashore. We had made good progress, I reflected, but it would take a few days to shift the stink of so many fish. I don't even know if I chose the right location, but you know, it is what it is. So it kind of just seems to want me to take a particular path at this point. I think I'm going to need to stop and get some more cash. We boarded the a Chinese junk with billowing patterned sails and a red and gold phoenix painted upon its prow, bound for Beijing. Do you take passengers often? Captain Zhao made a small gesture with his right hand as if waving away a stray thought. In peacetime we do, he said. It was not a surprising response. It had been ten years since the last opium war, but European power and Russia still scratch at China's borders. Don't try to entertain me. <laughs> okay. I spent the first day aboard attending to my master's state and bringing him tea. I wonder, he murmured thoughtfully, do you know the first thing about decorum? What a question from my master. I redoubled my efforts, but to little avail. As night drew on, incredible stars filled the sky. It was most peaceful, beautiful moment. Peaceful, beautiful moment. Blech. Talk. English. I saw Captain Zhao reading a Chinese newspaper at breakfast and... Asked if he would tell me the news. He pressed his lips together. It is out of date. The Shin Pao is printed in Shanghai, and I only pick it up when I happen to dock there. What is the most interesting story? The paper is campaigning against the employment of young women in opium bars and French concession. He pointed at the article in question. As they are often asked to perform immoral services. They should campaign against the opium bars altogether, I huffed. Captain Zhao looked delicately surprised. I'm surprised to hear a foreigner say such a thing. I spent a stimulating afternoon in discussion with Captain Zhao as the wind filled our fully battened sails and sped us on our way to Beijing. I am not good with voices, but I'm just kind of reading it how I feel like reading it, not really keeping the one particular voice for any particular character. The had to dart between the hulking vessels of the Russian Far East Fleet to find space to dock. China, a land of mysteries, which no doubt we would merely glimpse before moving promptly on.
There were no airships sailing across the Beijing sky, nor any evidence of electrification. Though the Chinese did not shun all technology, were drawn by intricately worked and glided iron lions as often as human servants, and I saw animated metal and jade dragons. Perched on the gables of imperial buildings, breathing curls of steam vapor and flapping their enamel feathered wings. Furthermore, I was lucky enough to catch a performance of the famed opera, the cast consisting entirely of hydraulic elegances, automata by another name. No other nation boasted such a tradition. Though the Artificers Guild manufactured the bodies and mainsprings of the performers, their complex facial mechanisms were built by imperial artisans in strict secrecy. But the opera itself, my friends, it was a thing of great beauty. I forgot that the performers were fashioned from brass and iron, that their eyes were polished onyx, that their lips were gently glazed porcelain. I saw only the purity of their movements. We were the guests of a court official who clearly believed us to be spies or troublemakers of some nature. Possibly sensing my propensity to venture on a regrettably international scale. As we departed the auditorium, I slipped away from our hose and went backstage. Ah, oh, my friends, I assure you only a fraction of the theatrical dramatics take place on stage. My progress was quickly barred by a stage manager wearing a carved jade hairpin and an irate expression. What are you doing here? I wish to congratulate the automatons on their performance, I said smoothly. The stage manager looked politely bemused. They are rehearsing now, but come with me. She took me through a narrow corridor to the dressing rooms where... Flesh and blood actors were sitting across from automata, miming expressions and gestures. The automatons watched their onyx with onyx eyes and mimicked them exactly. Do you each teach one automata? I asked. One of the actors shook his head and swapped places with his companion as proof. No single actor is perfect, but if we teach them our most perfect gesture, our most prized ability, then perhaps they will achieve true perfection. Do you not resent them? I asked, marveling at his calm tone. How can I resent such mastery of art? The actor asked, reached out to stroke the automaton's pale cheek. The performers you saw tonight are a hundred years old. They will have eternity to practice their craft. Ah, oh, my friends, let me assure you, their beauty was more than mere practice. I made my way back to the lodgings to meet up with Monsieur Fogg. A pair of opium addicts were slumped in an alley, Faces blankly blissful, despite the emancipation of their limbs. I saw the poison and rot at the heart of Beijing and wondered how long even such a grand structure could endure it. I'm almost halfway through. As night fell... I helped the kitchen staff clean. Earning 82 pounds. Good job, me. Can't I go that way? I'm sure Fog looks steadfast. My funds at home are not unlimited. I prefer not to draw on them, but... I 
I regarded the bank as we entered, as big as any London branch, there would be no doubt serve us well. You would like to take out funds. It may take a few days. We cannot afford to wait even a single day, I declared. We need to find some other ways to fund ourselves. I didn't know you could do that. We boarded the Beijing Express for the next leg of the journey through China to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I am part of the company. From Beijing to Hong Kong was another thousand miles, but the train line took a clever route that avoided most of the large towns entirely, running without stopping by the shortest route possible. I passed the time attending to my master's state and bringing him tea, and he perked up rapidly. Even Evening turned to night, and the train did not stop or slow. The countryside fell away to be replaced by busy, bustling working towns. Large industrial plants belched steam into the air, and mechanical contraptions stalked between warehouses. I watched with fascination at the countryside turned to the beginnings of urban sprawl. This would be a city of dirt and filth, and yes, excitement. Two days? Okay, so I have two days. Monsieur Fogg looked quite resolved by now. I knew well the dark look in my master's eyes. To the bank, he declared. I regarded the bank as we entered. It was a heaven of burnished wood and brass fittings, with quiet spaces and long halls and ample staff. You wish to make a withdrawal? The man drew asked. You may have to wait a few days. What day is today? So... Require a thousand pounds, I calculated. The manager made a note. I will check with the head office to make the transfer. Naturally, she declared, I expect an answer tomorrow morning. Okay, so I gotta wait till tomorrow.
don't know why I would need to stop a bear. So. I was looking over a bolt of bright red Chinese silk when a man accosted me. This man had a mustache so fine, so luxuriant, so well tended, that I briefly lost the power of speech. I watched mesmerized as it quivered with every word of introduction. It seemed his name was Fix. He offered me a drink, and given that I had a few hours to spare, I could not in good conscience refuse. He led me into a dingy basement where a sour-faced Chinese woman presided over several tables and a few couches with men and women, mostly Europeans, in various states of rolling intoxication. This is an opium den, I exclaimed uneasily. The gin is good, he told me, and ordered us a bottle to prove his claim. It was thin and sharp, but not wholly distasteful. We chatted amiably for a time, though I noted he kept my glass full and not his own. Listen, he said abruptly, I'm a police detective sent from the London office. You, a detective, I could not hide my incredulity, but he presented me with his commission, which seemed in all respects genuine and correct. You have been duped, he resumed. Mr. Fogg's wager is a pretext. Last September, a robbery of 55,000 pounds was committed at the Bank of England by a person whose description answers exactly to that of Mr. Phileas Fogg. My master is too dull to be a bank robber, I roared with laughter and banged upon the table with my open hand. What rubbish! You know scarcely anything of your master, Fix ground on. You went into his service the day he departed on this so-called wager, carrying little but a large quantity of bank notes. I felt a sudden doubt. Everything Fix said was, after all, true. My master was a mysterious fellow whose motives were not easily perceived, and his wager, well, it was a most peculiar one to be sure. The detective hissed a breath which fluttered the tips of his oiled mustache. I could arrest you as his accomplice. I have done nothing wrong, I protested. Then you must help me, he replied. Fix pressed a pipe into my hand, and I unthinkingly lifted it to my mouth. And consider the matter deeply. What if Fix was right? My master's journey around the world was a curious business. His monomania for travel was much more reasonably explained in terms of a bank robber's need for escape than a mere wager. My fingers shook. The pipe was in my mouth before I realized what I was doing. The sweet smoke precolated through my lungs and my head felt heavy. Opium, I breathed in accusation. The last thing I remember is the blurred and wavering outline of Fix's self-satisfied face as I fell upon the table. I guess I sleep. Monster Fog was nowhere to be seen. I curled up alone on a street corner, penniless, destitute, the worst kind of rogue. I guess I can only sleep. Another night sleeping rough. Would I survive out here much longer without my master? Need to go there to go that far, so... Alright, airship. I woke in a small dark cabin with the familiar hum of an airship motor underneath me. And as for my head, it was attached to my body and that was the best that could be said of the situation. I had clearly overindulged the previous night and I began to castigate myself in the strictest of terms.
A fragmented series of images sprang into my mind with vivid force. An opium den fixes accusation against my master, an opium pipe pressed into my gin-soaked hands, and then only blackness. I resolved to find an answer to the most important question. Where was my master? Just as soon as I could bring myself to uprightness, that was. Ambulation was a task best approached in stages, and I am ashamed to say that I fell at the first h hurdle and collapsed back into my hard cot, trembling and insinent. Insensate. I don't know how to say that word. I draw the scratchy blanket about my shoulders and ventured out of my cabin at dawn. Having gathered my opium stewed wits during the night, I spotted a wind burned member of the crew. The tool belt at her waist hung rope with rope, bolt cutters, and all manners of strangely shaped tools. Excuse me, I croaked rather more weakly than intended. She looked me over and then chuckled. Oh, you are a mysterious late arrival. How is your head? Tolerable. She rattled her bolt cutters and I winced. Oh, yes, you seem perfectly well. Is there an Englishman on board, I demanded. She told me there were plenty, and I endeavored to describe Monsieur Fogg so as to distinguish him from the others. An impeccably dressed, reserved man, I offered. No, she shook her head, but an Englishman carried you aboard and paid for your berth. He said you were ill, though you were clearly half crazed with opium. She shrugged and added, he had a magnificent mustache. Bix, that blackguard, had paid for my ticket from Hong Kong to Yokohama. Separate me from my master. the cold truth of my situation i would arrive at yokohama the following morning without a penny to my name or even a change of clothes and with no notion of my master's whereabouts i could only rely on myself for who knew when or if monsieur fogg would find me he was an utterly cold-blooded sort of gentleman it could very well choose to pursue the winning of his wager over the searching out of an errant servant so i made full use of that salafard fix his ticket and attacked the buffet with the gusto of a man who was not sure when his next meal would come from, for indeed I was not. Fog splits from ballet. We tethered at Yokohama in the early afternoon. I greeted the wharf waterfront apprehensively, my eye passing lightly over the slope-roofed buildings, carriages, and bare cherry trees. I took a deep breath and puffed out my chest. I had been in far worse circumstances than these. With that thought, I stepped foot onto Japanese soil. Lay down alone in the shade of a tree, broke, helpless, no better than a criminal. I joined the circus. It was, in retrospect, the most sensible action I could have taken, given my varied skills at acrobatics and clowning. I had quickly realized that the matter of how to find my master was entirely secondary to the larger question of ready funds. And ready funds were what the sharp-eyed proprietor of the traveling circus offered. And no one seemed to need a valet, so I became a performer once more. I volunteered myself to... Uh, I'm going to go with the fire one. Swallow fire while perched atop a horse. The previous fire eater was indisposed with what the prioritor assured me was the merest touch of cough. The Russian horse trainer crossed herself as I began my practice. A few things later, it was time for my first performance. I decided to focus upon 
staying firmly on the horse, which was a salutary choice as my assigned steed was a frothing demon of an equine with murder in her red-rimmed eyes. I dropped one of the torches as I rode in, but did manage to keep an elegant seat. As the crowd cheered, I tilted my head back and brought a flaming torch to my lips. For blue, it was hot. I dipped the fire into my mouth, and at that moment... My eyes alighted upon a familiar face in the audience. It was none other than my master. I blew out a breath of fire and then waved my flaming torch widely at Monsieur Fogg. The audience hissed and stamped their feet in disapproval as I scrambled off the demon horse and ran to my master. He was looking particularly unperturbed by the disturbance I was causing. How did you find me? I asked in wonderment. It is of little consequence, was his only response. Come, we have lodgings to arrange and a journey to continue. We, oui, Monsieur Fogg, I agreed, counseling a hasty withdrawal from the ill-tempered glares of the circus performers and audience. That we do. I collected my pay packet and resigned my tenure after a single night. Two days. Before turning in to the night, I afforded my master every service, providing him with clipped mustaches with int the intention he would have a comfortable night. Well, good. I'm glad they improved. We took a room and settled in, and I attended to Monsieur Fogg, providing him with fresh clothing. I feel like that's just the safest thing to do because, you know, obviously, I can't be trusted out by myself. <laughs> hmm, well that's unfortunate. I might have to wait. Well, crap.
Maybe I could go here. And then travel that way. The Sagawara was an Imperial Japanese steamship designed by French engineers and crewed by naval conscripts drawn from all four occupations. The captain bowed slightly in greeting and I... Gave her a deeper bow of respect, which caused her to raise an approving eyebrow. Welcome aboard, she told us as the crew raced about, readying the ship for departure. With God's grace, we will have a swift journey. <laughs> I encountered Captain on deck in the morning and noticed that she wore a katana and a beautifully worked sheath. That is a beautiful weapon, I said reverently, having been swept away by the recent Parisian fashion. The captain ducked her head a little. It is not a military issue. It has a personal value to me. I made a sound of encouragement, but she did not take the cue to continue. Oh well, there would be time enough to get to know the captain better on the journey. In the morning, I saw Captain praying at the little Protestant chapel beside the galley. What do you pray for, Captain? I asked. I pray for the health and long life of the Emperor, she said so fervently that the commonplace words rang with truth. He looks to the west and thus towards progression. I considered her words. And you are a product of this progress? Her hand closed over the hilt of her katana. Five years ago, it was illegal for a peasant or a woman to wear a sword. Now Emperor has given me a warship. Yet you still wear a samurai's katana, I pointed out. A look of sadness crossed Captain's face. It was my grandfather's. The men of my family are all samurai. They must be very proud of you. No. Captain closed her eyes. My father is still loyal to his do and fights against the Emperor. Your father does not believe in progress? The captain gave me a tired smile. The Emperor has reduced the samurai's privileges and cut their wages. My father is angry. Will he change his mind? I hope so, she said softly, for he cannot stand against the march of progress and the might of Imperial Japan. An officer came to fetch Captain away for some pressing duty, and I was left with whirling thoughts. Manila Harbor was a desolate, desperate-looking place. The ship was a regal sight as she pulled into the docks. I hope you reconcile with your family, Captain, I said as we disembarked. And you, she replied, do not drink the water. <laughs> okay, noted. Don't drink the water, guys. Monsieur Fogg looked steadfast. By now I recognized the heavy look on my master's brow. 
To our financial masters, he sighed. I regarded the manager of the bank we entered, a small, sweaty woman who greeted us with cool enthusiasm. You want to withdraw funds, we were told. It may take a short time. We require 1,500 pounds, I said. The manager scratched her cheek. I will have to telegraph England, sir. The money will be ready in two working days. We arrived at the Spanish governed capital of Manila at most inappropriate time. The city had recently suffered the depredations of a major typhoon and the short efforts at rebuilding had been stalled by an outbreak of the dreaded cholera morbus. It originated with sailors of the steamer from the nearby town of that was the local rumor in any case. Infected establishments were burned daily by the sanitary board. With our hotel one of the casualties We relocated near the river, a charming locale thronged with Filipino women in Maria Clara gowns and men wearing the stylish Spanish. Concerned with the possibility of infection, I ensured that Monsieur Fogg ate only from the kitchens, which had avoided all traces of the disease. From our window, I could see carts piled high with dead being taken to the mountains to be burned, rather than interred in a churchyard which put me in a morbid frame of mind. It does not do well to dwell on such matters, however, so I attempted to put the considerations behind me. But the city smells of disease, and I will be glad to leave. With the last few hours of the evening, I went to stretch my legs and found nervous Chinese ragamuffin who had lost a motor monocle, which I helped to recover, and from whom I learned that merchants in Burlington will pay extremely well for sugar canes from Panama City. I assured him we were unlikely to head that way, at which my friend nodded. I can un can't understand travel, but now look at me. As night fell, I afforded my master every service, providing him with a haircut with the hopes he would have a comfortable night. Still not enough, Monsieur Fogg declared. We must visit the bank once more. The manager was somewhat surprised to see us back again. We require 1,500 pounds, I declared. The manager waved to his assistant. I will need to contact London first, of course. 
I should have your money in two working days. Before the night ended, I spent a while talking to the hotelier to find out what I could, hearing from him that merchants in San Pedro pay a huge amount for handheld mirrors of, from Singapore. A most interesting snippet. We made ourselves comfortable for the night and... I helped the kitchen staff clean, earning 87 pounds, as well as learning from him that you could pick up harmonicas in Brisbane, extremely valuable in New Orleans. An excellent snippet. it's still two days. For the remainder of the day, he tendered to fog, ensuring he was comfortable with the dear wish he would have a restorative night. We're running out of time, my dude. As night fell, I made certain to repack and iron everything to better prepare us for our inevitable departure. We boarded the Reina Cristina, a Spanish Torres type airship. Its gondola shaped to resemble one of the infamous Spanish galleons of previous centuries. And as richly outfitted with Philippine hardwood furniture, fusion silk curtains, and lacquered ornamental uh, automata imported from China, my cabin resembled a fashionable salon more than an airship berth. Monsieur Fogg looked a little pale and odd well, but I reasoned he would quickly approve now that we were away from the disease-ridden city of Manila. Character is now squall. Our journey to Honolulu would take four days. The airship would refuel and go on without us. From there, we had other plans. The Filipino crew spoke of a mixed tag-along in Spanish, all mixed with Lascar sailors' cant, which... Utterly fascinated me, though I did not have the skill to understand it. Don't bother trying to learn it, the captain remarked in elegant Spanish. 
You need a sailor's heart to do so. Do you not think I possess one? I retorted. I would never dare presume, monsieur, he bowed, his short jacket pulling up to display a slice of perfectly white shirt. He added teasingly, many gentlemen would consider such an insinuation an insult. Luckily, I am not a gentleman, I laughed, and so considered an honor. The captain laughed, his dark eyes glittering with mirth in the reflection sun. Truly, he said, I meant the most remarkable people as captain of an airship. When Sherfog looked shivering and weak, there was definitely something amiss. A portrait of King Amadio, the first hung in one of the relatively unused corridors of the gondola. which I was exploring in hope of finding a secret or two, and indeed I stumbled across a small room set with a crucifix and an altar. Clearly someone aboard was, literally, a closet Christian. <laughs> Over dinner, the captain told me about Honolulu, where we would stop on the morrow if I believed his telling. It was a giddy paradise that could barely be real. Monsieur Fogg's condition appeared to be growing worse. As we settled down for the night, I was struck by an unrelated thought. Monsieur Fogg, the dateline. I have altered our watch already, Monsieur Fogg replied calmly. Did you think I might forget? My master was, of course, correct. With an eye such as his, it was unthinkable that he might miss such a detail. Imagine what might have transpired had we forgotten. A less precise man than Monsieur Fogg might have finished on the 80th day, and yet believed himself to have lost. We arrived in Honolulu Bay in good time, and the crew landed us, then deflated the envelope to refill it. It was a while before we could retrieve our things, so I spent the time walking the beach, watching sharks frolicking in the crystal water. After Manila, this place was a paradise on earth. Then we were finally discharged from our duty as passengers, and the airship lifted away into the sky. 